do you mean privacy? And uh, I'm Sarah. And after this, if anybody has questions, I'll be out in the lobby kind of hanging around for just a little while and buying some stuff probably. Um, this is not my computer, so if I get confused on what button I need to push, I may have to ask somebody over there because I can really actually see the buttons. Um, so in the next 20 minutes, here's what we're going to do, and I guess we're going to do it very quickly because it's only 20 minutes. I tend to usually talk really very quickly, so that shouldn't be a problem. But if we go too fast, and you can follow along as you're going to slow down just a little bit. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to explore some important concepts about privacy and uh, consider some of the ways that technology has impacted privacy. Most of those you're probably aware of, so we'll just touch on those very, very briefly. Look at the findings of a study that we did on privacy cognitions. That's how you think about things and behaviors, what you actually do. And look, look really at how you stack up against uh, groups of other people that we've talked to. And we're going to do this by uh, asking questions. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I want you to answer them very quickly. You do that by raising your hand, yes, no. It's kind of an anonymous thing, so I don't need to know anything about you. Just I'm just kind of looking to see how you stack up against other people. So you actually turn it upside down and uh, ask these questions, yes or no. I have reviewed my browser privacy policy. Yes? No. I always delete, and you can look at the word always extra hard, unwanted cookies. Yes? No. <laughs> That's cool. I have read my company or school or wherever you happen to be, and I don't need to know what it is, privacy policy. Yes? No. I always read privacy policies, or privacy policies, if you happen to be from the UK, as I sometimes am, of worldwide websites that I visit. Yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> you guys need to be here. Uh, I always read, don't laugh, end user licensing agreements. I said, don't laugh, of new software before installing it on my computer. Yes? No. <laughs> I always encrypt sensitive emails. Yes? No. I don't know where you work, too. <laughs> I always encrypt the data on my hard disk. The data on my hard disk is currently encrypted. Yes? I know you guys work, too. No. Hackers. I like to control disclosure of information about myself and or my transactions. Yes? No. Okay, so what is privacy anyway? We're going to take a look at those responses and how they compare with uh, a large group of, uh, three large groups of information system security professionals in just a couple of minutes. We went out and first asked a lot of people what were their ideas about privacy. And some people said privacy really refers to information that's about me, my own personal stuff like where I live, my name, which you all sort of know now. Information about what you do, maybe what you do at work, where you go, what you buy, things like that. Some people said the privacy really expands out a bit, even to things you know, so I'm talking about the sorts of things that you may use at work, all the data that you happen to be working with, even if it isn't about you. Some people said, no, 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 privacy isn't just about information about you, but it's also freedom from being approached by other people. That is, um, I have the right not to be intruded on my own space, and if people intrude in my personal space, which will differ culture to culture, they're invading my privacy. And some of the ideas we have about unsolicited commercial email would fit into this sort of analysis area. Because if you don't want to be approached and somebody approaches you, it could be considered invasion of privacy, depending on who you are and where you live and what you think. Then we went out and did a literature review and looked at some cultural aspects of privacy and some gender issues in privacy. These are, these are pretty interesting. We found that in Japan, the personal distance space is a lot less between people. And so you, you, know, you can be a lot closer to somebody before they, before they feel like they're invading your space. If you're in a doctor's office, it's like, what? If you're in a doctor's office, it's, it's, it's likely that you're going to be separated mainly by a curtain instead of an, an, being in another room. That, that may happen because it's not considered to be a need to have a privacy in that situation. In the United Kingdom, where I sometimes live, um, we have traffic cameras, and we, and we have cameras in WC2 to keep track of where we are as we walk down the street to fight against crime. When I was living in South Florida, we had a lot of problems with people who had uh, 
going past speed limits and having fatal accidents. And there was a big outcry, oh, we need to have some traffic cameras. And people in that community said, we do not want traffic cameras and invades our privacy. So the idea was quickly dropped because the community didn't like it. Whereas in the UK, the cameras are still there. In Sweden, it's really interesting. Here in the US, we don't put information generally about our income tax returns up in public in the internet for people to read. In Sweden, you'll find much more detailed information about your tax returns, and that could be due in part to the fact that the amount of money people make, the, the amounts are much more tightly compressed, whereas a, a much more disparity in the United States. But in Sweden, you find that information. In the US, you don't. Generally, in the UK, US, there's a difference in how people perceive how businesses handle their own personal information. I can never remember which one of those things they don't do a great job. So when you come up, there's a white paper about this topic that I can get for you if you'd like to read more about, about these cultural aspects. And in Saudi Arabia, which I found to be the most interesting, you are tasked with protecting your neighbor's privacy when you build a house. You need to build that house so that when you're within your house, your windows do not look upon personal areas of their home. So you don't protect your own privacy that way, but you protect their privacy by your own behavior. That's a very, to me, a very interesting cultural difference. I don't know why all these things exist, because we didn't go that deeply. We just were interested in what the differences were. We looked a little, just a little bit at why. Who you are makes a big difference, and I, I know you can tell I have a big budget for graphics. Um, men and women have a real difference in how they perceive their privacy on the internet. And there are some very interesting studies done that show women tend to feel about half as safe as men in the areas of privacy on the internet. Children seem not to have quite as many rights of privacy because you can go on the internet, of course, and, and, and look at children in daycare centers and schools, and a lot of places don't have to have permission to do that. The children are just put up there. And I found that, uh, I remember the, the cartoon on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. You can go on the internet and look at people's dogs, look at dogs for sale on the internet, the living creatures' dogs. and. You can also look at people's dogs as they're boarded, and you can see when people are away because you can tell when their dogs are boarded. But dogs evidently don't have this, our cats or ferrets or whatever's being boarded. And I won't give the name of the kennels, but I, I was taking a look. Very interesting. You can see all the different dogs in the kennels. I guess dogs don't really have rights of privacy. Uh, what's changed? You know most of this stuff, and so we won't talk about it too much except to say that uh, Things have gotten a lot worse as far as te when technology has been introduced. We used to have filing cabinets where we kept information. Now things can get exported without a, any big effort. We used to have walls of concrete that held information in it. Now you can access it remotely, much more readily available. We used to get weekly brochures or information in grocery stores or places where we shopped. Now p people can track with RFID or spyware, uh, cookies, whatever, see what it is we want and what we like to do and track our preferences and do whatever they like with that information. And of course, there's always inferences because there are really, really huge amounts of information out there on the internet. It's much easier to call that information all together and, and find out something about one specific target. Things are getting worse. I think you probably know that a lot of websites collect personal data and uh, do what they will with it. Now, usually they do tell you in their on-site web privacy policies that are, that are printed up there what they'll do with that information. Of course, if you don't need those privacy policies, you're not likely to know. And that information can change pretty much at will. They usually tell you it can change, but if you haven't read it, you wouldn't know that. And uh, some websites give away or sell the information. And of course, there's malicious disclosure. One of the, well, I guess, the biggest increase we've seen where I work is uh, the remote access trojans and the, uh, the outright theft of data viruses, worms, blended threats, and such that export data are set up backdoors so people can come in and, and grab the data. Now, there are technical solutions. You know, for the browser privacy thing, and they're not perfect solutions, right? But you do have personal uh, platform for privacy policies, your P3P, enterprise security management tools. You can get all this stuff, software that destroys cookies, so you don't have to manually do it yourself, or even too much know what you're doing. You know, there are licensing agreements you can read and privacy policies on websites that tell you what they're going to do with your information. And there are antiviruses, firewalls, and all this sort of stuff to protect you against not all, but most of the Trojan viruses, Trojans viruses that are out there. And, and blended threats. I wouldn't be from semantic if I didn't use the word blended threats, and I've used it twice. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so how are we doing? How, how are we doing? Well, we did a study, and the study was to determine if privacy was important to information system security professionals, and then to determine if the functional daily behaviors related to specific acts they might take reflected that importance or lack thereof. That science speak for do they, do they you know, walk the walk or do they just talk about it? 
Um, of course, because there are so many different definitions of privacy, we had to come up with an operational definition. How, how are we going to see if they value privacy if we don't really know what they think it might be because people have such a wide variation of what they think it is. So we said, okay, for this study, and we will operationally define privacy as control over the disclosure of information about yourself or your transaction. Then we first administered this to a focus group of 67 security and antivirus professionals, some of whom were here and who took the survey and tell me that they radically changed their behavior after being asked these questions. We refined the survey, changing P3P to browser privacy policy because no one had heard of P3P, and add cookies, site privacy policies, encryptions, and licensing agreements. And then we went out and administered this study to uh, security professionals at three security-focused type conferences. And the study questions, the, the surveys did meet the test for validity, reliability, and statistical significance in the selection of, this, of the population that was sampled. And all the stuff about how that works is in the white paper. And we got a bunch of numbers which you won't be able to read. Okay, basically this says, we asked the questions, if you said that you like to control this disclosure, you, it's important. If not, it's unimportant. Remember, yes and no. You can see people are pretty much split. About you know, people are pretty much in a bad, bad way of thinking. I guess the analysis, which you can read much more easily than all those numbers, that the thought I like to control disclosure of information about myself and my transaction is not reflected in the behaviors related to browser privacy policies, deletion of unfriend cookies, reading of privacy policies, reading licensing agreement, or encrypting sensitive emails. And the reason we added the question about the sensitive emails, I hadn't really thought to ask it, but as I was doing the survey in the beginning, some people would, I, I got quite a few comments like, well, you know, I know I'm not supposed to send emails from home as I go about doing my job, but the boss says I really need to do this quickly, and I'm going to get in trouble if I don't submit it in time, and nobody's really going to read my email anyway, and I know I work for the unnamed agency, which probably consists of letters in some country, which isn't the U.S., but... You know, I'm just going to do it just this once, and I, I know it's confidential, I probably shouldn't do it, but who's really going to be looking at my email? So I, I got quite a few of those sorts of responses, so we added a question about encrypting sensitive emails. So why is this? Why do people say they value the disclosure, the control over the disclosure of the information about themselves? Why do they say they value it and not do it? I think there, there's something called cognitive dissonance, which I saw someone else was actually speaking about at Black Hat Briefing, so I don't know how many of you heard about that in depth, but again, there's more about this in depth in your white paper. This means that you tend to focus on the benefits of the act you've chosen to do. You know, you're going to save a lot of time if you send your email home really quickly, even though you're not supposed to. You're going to, you're going to save your company money if you do this or that. You're going to accomplish a lot more work if you don't waste all your time reading those policies. And you dismiss the benefits of what you didn't choose. You say, that's really not so important. And nobody reads you as soon. We say, do you, do you read the you as everybody goes, <laughs> everybody kind of laughs about it. No one would read my email. I'm not likely to get a virus. I don't have time to delete cookies. You know, I don't really do anything and that's really important. So that's cognitive dissonance. And you attempt to resolve it by doing these sorts of things. So what are we supposed to do about this? When even in the, this population, the responses were pretty similar in, in most of the areas to the responses that we got from the people that are working in the information system security field. So what are we supposed to do to get our behaviors to match up with what we say we believe in this particular area? There probably other areas of life where we have the same thing going on, but this is the one that we're talking about now. I think we need to educate people that are in organizations and just people that are thinking and learning about security, about the time loss, the money loss, the work loss, credibility, security, all the real problems this kind of, kind of uh, not doing what you say can talk. Say, I told you I'd be that way early. So you plan to work in security field or you're already working in it? What do you need to do? What can you do to try and make these changes? I think probably the key thing here is to plan and encourage healthy cultures of security in organizations. You know, discourage what we say is inappropriate group think. If everybody laughs because some poor schmuck in your organization is going out to look at getting his penis enlarged, and so you're all laughing about that while he's clicking away on this stuff, which is letting your corporate data dance out the door, you're not having a healthy culture of security. You're not really taking it very seriously in your, in your organization. You need to really encourage taking it seriously. So if that's what you're going to do, and you, either you work in that field now or you're planning to work in that field, you need to really think, is this something that really matters to me, or do I just kind of like to sort of do it and maybe not take it too seriously. And ask yourself, are you really going to be a leader? Are you just going to have whatever culture happens to evolve in your organization? Because as the security people in your organizations or in your schools or whatever, you have the opportunity to make a real difference and get people thinking about what it is they're doing, not just going blindly into the motions and kind of laughing at the jokes and watching the data dance out the door, which is not very cool, causes lots of problems. So conclusion, 
Privacy is really, really important, no matter how you define it, no matter how you think of it. Most of the people here, maybe four or five people here, said they don't really value it, that disclosure. But most of you said that you value that. At the same time, many, if not most of you, didn't do some of these things that actually can, can work toward protecting that sort of privacy. There are certainly impediments to privacy. Technology helps impede privacy by the speed with which it develops, and then people have to catch up with how to do the protection. There are threats to privacy. People like to find out things about people, and there are solutions out there. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be out in the lobby, and I can answer them. And all done. Bye-bye. <laughs>